Hi, welcome to the first lecture for politics and society. So today we're going to be talking about ideology, with particular focus on the psych uh, psychology of ideology. Um, so before we get started kind of talking about what ideology is, I want to give a couple of examples to talk about why things like ideology are important. Um, and to do so, we're going to have to look at what it is that people know about politics and why does it matter what people know about politics. Um, so there's all kinds of examples. We could spend an entire course talking about kind of political knowledge and what people know. So I wanted to start with a couple of uh, fun examples that are drawn from foreign policy. Um, All right, so first um, we, we have this map um, of, of the world. And uh, this map was um, um, created um, around the time of the uh, conflict between uh, Russia, or when the conflict between Russia and Ukraine began. Uh, so I believe in, uh, in 2014, this map was created. Um, and so the question that led to the, the production of this map was a survey that asked people, um, so all respondents to the survey were uh, given a copy of this map um, without the different dots. And they were asked to simply place a dot where the Ukraine is located. So it was kind of just a test to see whether respondents knew where the uh, Ukraine was located. And so this map that we see here is um, what uh, everybody, uh, everybody's response. Um, so uh, each dot means a response. And so the brighter the colors, so the brighter the red means kind of the more higher density of response. All right, so a, a few things are noticeable. So um, a lot of people did uh, fairly well. So if we look uh, kind of, you know, at where we, you see the red, um, you know, a lot of people uh, were kind of in, in the area of the red and, um, we're fairly close to Ukraine. You know, I, I can't necessarily, you can't necessarily judge people if they don't know exactly where the Ukraine is. Um, I, I wouldn't, um, we're not in class, so I can't ask you to, I'll point to it on a map, but sure, many of you might not get exactly correct, right? But at least kind of having, you know, if it's a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, uh, knowing that the Ukraine's, you know, borders Russia would be some important information knowing that the Ukraine's in Europe. So putting a dot somewhere in Europe near boundary with Russia would be reasonable um, guesses. Um, and so a lot of people did quite well, but then if we look, there's a lot of dots um, that are um, not particularly close uh, to um, where the Ukraine would be located. Right, so there's quite a clustering of them, for example, in Greenland. Uh, there are some in Canada, so uh, just in case. Uh, so many, or certainly some of the respondents uh, in, in the US thought that uh, the Ukraine was located within Canada. Um, particularly depressing, I suppose, would be that actually several people, um, not many, but you know, at least a, a few people um, located the Ukraine within uh, the United States. Um, so not only were those respondents not able to identify where the Ukraine was located, they couldn't even identify where their own country was located on the map. Um, and so looking at a lot of these dots, it can, it can seem quite funny and, oh, people didn't, uh, you know, know where it is, what's, what's the big deal? Um, well, the respondents were also then asked a follow-up question, right? So after they had kind of um, pointed to its location, uh, they're asked questions about how they thought the U.S. would respond to uh, Russia's um, kind of invasion or um, intervention in the Ukraine. Um, and what we see is that if we look at those responses, there's a correlation um, between, you know, how close people were to the look uh, actually pointed to the Ukraine and the response. So the further respondents thought that Ukraine was from its actual location, the more they wanted the US to intervene militarily. So the less they understood about kind of, you know, geopolitics, um, the, that actually had an influence on their preferred policy options. So even controlling for a series of other um, characteristics, the less accurate participants were, the more they want the US to use force, the greater the threat they saw Russia as posing to US interests, and the more they thought 
uh, that using force would advance US national security interests, right? So um, now maybe something else is causing both of these, but clearly there's some connection between how much people knew about Ukraine and what they wanted. So what people know about politics matters in what decisions they want to make politically. And that's, that's important. And this study, um, you know, got reported uh, um, not only in the academic literature, got reported uh, on many of the late night kind of comedy uh, shows, um, kind of showing uh, kind of the funny side to it, but there's also a depressing side to it in terms of, you know, um, if enough people don't know about these subjects, are we going to be choosing policies that aren't ideal? Right, so here's another um, example. And this one um, is from 2015. So around the time of the presidential primaries in 2015, um, in kind of in, in the lead up to the primaries. Um, so shortly before the election that led to the election, or to the election that brought uh, Donald Trump into power. And the simple question in the survey was, should we bomb Agrabah? Uh, and I want you to uh, think briefly about whether you think it's a good idea to bomb Agrabah. Um, and here's kind of the response that people had. So in the poll of primary voters, so those who were voting for who would be the presidential candidate, 30% um, of Republicans and 19% of Democrats, so almost one in three are Republicans and almost one in five Democrat, Democrats supported the bombing of Agrabah and only 13% of Republicans and 36% of Democrats opposed it. So almost one in three Republicans and almost 20% of Democrats supported the bombing of Agrabah. Now, while you're thinking about whether you would support bombing Agrabah, um, I want you to think about where in the world is Agrabah. Because, um, you know, it's probably important to know where it is and what has Agrabah done, right? If we're going to be bombing Agrabah, we, 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 we'd like to, you know, uh, it, we should think that it's done something wrong. Uh, so what has Agrabah done that um, to be provoking this type of response? Um, and we'd have to be thinking back to 2015 in this particular case. Um, and so these are the type of thoughts that people should be having before making a decision, right? So um, what has Agrabah done? And does that thing that they've done deserve bombing? And so if you don't know what Agrabah has done, and if you don't know what they, uh, whether that thing is deserving of bombing, then you shouldn't be saying that, um, you shouldn't be supporting uh, the use of military force. And so what's problematic in this case with those, um, the people who said that they um, support uh, the bombing, um, and actually even to a certain extent, those who had no opinion on it, what, what, what's the problem here? But in particularly those who said, um, uh, th that they support it because they had a clear decision they think it should be bombed. Well, Agrabah is the fictional kingdom in the film Aladdin. Um, so recently remade, so at the time people would have had to think back to the 1990s animated version. Um, but even if you couldn't remember at the time when you're answering the question that Agrabah is actually a fictional kingdom, well, it's not, even if you don't realize it's a fictional kingdom, um, which is kind of what makes the question funny, um, you clearly don't know where it is and what it's done because it hasn't done anything. Um, yet a significant number of people um, thought that it should be bombed. And, um, and so what we see is that political knowledge, uh, and particularly about foreign policy, but political knowledge in general tends to be very low. And we've seen from both of these examples that even if people hold incorrect information, um, there people, uh, how inaccurate the information can have an influence on decision making. So we see that from um, the Ukraine case and that people in, in, in the case of the Agrabah case or the Aladdin case, that people are willing to make decisions and have opinions uh, and support even things like war um, when they actually really know nothing about the situation. Um, and so those, those are re relatively concerning. Now, it's not all bad news. Um, it turns out, so uh, early on, we, um, we uh, did studies in political science about how little people know. Uh, this was very concerning uh, in terms of, you know, does this mean that people are systematically making bad decisions? 
Um, and it turns out that um, even though people don't know much about politics, they can often make decisions that are in line with their interests. Um, so if, in other words, they are often able to make the same decisions that they would have made if they had full information. Uh, and so how do they do that? So in order to make these decisions with minimal effort and information, they use what are called schemas, scripts, or heuristics, so rules of thumb or cognitive shortcuts to make good decision without all the specifics. So they use rules of thumb to kind of looking at, you know, how would I react in this type of situation? So I don't know much about war. Well, what do I tend to think about, you know, conflicts in these type of situations? So with the proper uh, use of uh, heuristics, individuals can reach the same decisions that they might reach with a more informed and deliberate decision-making process. Uh, so as if they've been going through a rational deliberative process, they can actually use a very short, um, uh, simplified, uh, intuitive um, method to, to kind of reach similar decisions. And so how, uh, what cognitive shortcuts are they able to use? What are the sources of these cognitive shortcuts or of these rules of thumb or the, uh, the heuristics? So some are internal. Um, and so ideology, attitudes, values, um, that so people think that they hold inside and we'll talk more about those. And some are external. Uh, so cues from the media, leaders and other foreign policy elites. So for example, in the case of the media or leaders, um, say you happen to agree a lot with Justin Trudeau on many different issues and Justin Trudeau gives a speech and says that he's in support of this policy. Well since you usually agree with Justin Trudeau on policy and he said that he supports it, well then you might just take it as a cue that you should support it too. Now this may be one of the few cases where you and he disagree but many of the times because you usually agree with him, many of the times then he's going to be making a decision that even if you had thought it through and knew all the facts you'd be making too. Uh, same thing if you're looking at media, if there's a trusted media source who you often agree with, right? And if then they come and give their position on a certain issue, um, well then many people will take that as kind of a cue as to what their position should be on the, uh, on the issue. Uh, now it's not always, going to work, but a lot of time, and particularly if you don't care enough about politics to, to stay completely informed, um, this can work to make um, you know, the right decisions for what you would want to, to be making. And so we're going to be looking at a lot of these, but we're going to be particularly focusing on the ideology side. So now let's turn a little bit more specifically to ideology. And we're going to be discussing what ideology is and where it comes from. Um, so this is the typical, if you, if you do a survey or a survey experiment, if you participate in one, this is one of the kind of typical questions. Um, there's slight uh, wording differences, but one of the typical questions that you might get. Um, so it would have the word ideology, but you might get something. Blow is a scale on which the political views that people might hold are arranged from extremely conservative to extremely liberal. Where would you place yourself on the scale? And so this is, um, and so people get this question and we take this to be identifying their political ideology, right? So some might take extremely liberal, liberal, slightly liberal, all the way through to extremely conservative. Um, but this doesn't necessarily um, tell us what people are understanding from extremely liberal and it doesn't help us identify too much what ideology is. Um, so. Here's a couple of definitions um, of, that uh, people have advanced for, um, for ideology. So we have a set of beliefs about the proper order of society and how it can be achieved. Or ideologies are the shared framework of mental models that groups of individuals possess that provide both an interpretation of the environment and a prescription as to how that environment should be structured. So in both of these cases, um, with both of these definitions, we see two functions to ideology, right? So first is an interpretation of the environment. So it describes the world as it is by making assertions um, or assumptions about human nature, historical events, present realities, and future possibilities. So um, one of the things ideology does is it shapes how we interpret our environment. How do, what do we believe or, how, or um, um, how do we believe the world functions? right? Um, how do people 
function? Um, what is kind of the historical context? Uh, what are the important uh, rea present realities about the world and what are the future possibilities for the world? So it, it shapes how we interpret how the world actually functions right now, right? And our beliefs about how the world functions is then gonna shape what we want. So um, if you believe that, for example, um, everybody is evil, right? Um, so you had an ideology based on a belief that everybody is e evil. That's kind of human nature, right? That would lead you to want or support different say policies or different uh, viewpoints than if you believe that everybody is inherently good from birth. Um, so the way that we understand the world around us, right, and the way the, we understand how the world functions has important impact on um, how we kind of behave within the world. The second function is envision the world as it should be. So specify and expect acceptable means of attaining social, economic, and political ideals, right? So what are the political ideals that we hold, right? So what are the things that we want? So not just the, the world the way the world, uh, how the world works, but also how the world should work. What should we be working towards as a society in terms of social goals, economic goals, and political goals? And what are the appropriate means for achieving it? And so you're, what we'll see is that different people hold different beliefs about not only how the world works, but how the world should work, what do we want it to look like, and what are the appropriate ways for getting towards those ideals. Uh, and so that's kind of the territory of ideology. So how does the world function? What are the appropriate means for kind of improving um, how the world is functioning right now? So the current situation. And what are we striving towards? What are the ideals that we are striving for? So where does ideology come from? And so there's two main places that we can identify it coming from. So the first is um, top down. So people get their ideology from the top down. And this it involves the acquisition of political attitudes through exposure, uh, exposure to ideological um, bundles that are socially constructed by political elites. And so we're going to return to this uh, in future classes. So when we're talking about socialization, right? But essentially, it's, it's coming from whenever an external source. Um, so other, so other political elites, um, your family, your friends, your school, um, social structures, um, any of those influences that help you learn how the world works, how it should work, and um, how we should work, strive to get towards those ideals. Um, any of that that comes from the outside is top down. And so, like I said, we're gonna be returning to those in future classes. Um, where we're gonna be looking a little bit more today is the bottom up. And so this is underlying psychological needs and motives that influence an individual's responsiveness to specific ideological um, positions. And um, this one's not talked about nearly as much as the top down. Um, and that's in, in many ways unfortunate um, because, so let's take, for example, um, racial inequality or homophobia or transphobia, right? And let's come from the perspective that, that I, I hope um, many of you will agree that we, we want to diminish or eliminate homophobia, transphobia. We want to uh, eliminate racial inequality. So let's come from that perspective that these are the things that, that we want to do. Um, from the top-down perspective, right, so we would need to be, to, to get to that place, we'd need to be changing, you know, what are the messages that we're getting from political elites? Um, what are the messages we're getting from the media? How is society structured? Because, you know, a lot of these things also come from kind of just structural inequality. So we need to be changing all these things. How are, you know, children and people socialized? Um, and that's really, really difficult. Um, particularly on racial inequality in, in the last few months, we've been having a lot of discussion about how we can go about making these changes. And uh, it's one of the, um, or two inevitable conclusions are, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and because there's a lot of changes that need to be made um, and that these changes are gonna be very difficult. Um, and, but despite how difficult those changes are gonna be, be arguably the bottom up, addressing the bottom up side 
is going to be even more difficult um, because it's dealing with underlying psychological needs. So not everybody is born with, say, the same um, need for, uh, you know, say, fear of uncertainty or fear of death or need for understanding of complex situations. Uh, people are born with different psychological needs when it comes to, for example, uncertainty. Some people are inherently fearful of uncertainty and need to resolve uncertainty. Some people don't really mind uncertainty. Um, and, and, and so many of these different kind of psychological needs or motives influence a good part of ideology, right? And we're going to turn to that in the future slides, how kind of built-in psychological needs that you wouldn't necessarily think don't sound inherently political, how they're linked to different ideological positions. Um, and so what becomes more difficult here is that how do we change psychological needs? Well, many of them are born from personality or um, inherited um, uh, through kind of a hereditary um, component when born. And so there are things that I mean, arguably, you can't be changed. Um, or, I mean, unless you go into the extreme position of um, genetic engineering, which I don't think is a position that many of us would want to, to be looking at. So when we're devising changes to society, what we need to also be bearing in mind are these psychological needs. Because any change that we make that doesn't bear in mind psychological needs of people who we don't necessarily agree with are going to fail because they're not addressing the underlying reasons why people hold these beliefs. So even if you ha stop having, you know, politicians, media, uh, friends saying things that you don't agree with, um, advancing positions that are antithetical towards racial equality. Even if you could eliminate all of those statements, right, because of certain psychological characteristics, some people are still going to be predisposed towards, you know, fearing other groups, for example. Um, and unless we can address that fear, right, and come up with ways of addressing that fear, then any policies we're putting in place are likely to fail. So that's why I, I start with kind of the psychological side, because A, it's kind of the innate side. It's not the, the learned side um, as much. Some of it can be learned. Um, some, um, you know, my, most of this kind of field of social psychology, if you've taken any psychology, um, can be learned. Um, but a good part of it is innate. Um, so it's kind of where we start from, um, our predispositions. Um, but it's also, um, an important part of making change. All right, so what are the dimensions of ideology? So we've given a brief definition kind of of what ideology is, we've looked at a couple of the components of it. Uh, we've looked a little bit at where it comes from. Um, so top down, bottom up. But if we wanna unpack the bottom up side, we need to kind of look at more specifically what, how is ideology structured? Um, so ideology is a mental map or schema consisting of interrelated networks of beliefs, opinions, and values, right? So we have a lot of beliefs about a diff different things or opinions or values about different things. Um, and so we end up kind of putting together many of these when we talk about ideology, we're, we're not just talking about one particular value, but we're talking about a clustering of values um, in kind of an interrelated way. So values that tend to be similar will be found within a particular ideology. But how is this mental map organized? Well, here's where there are some disagreements between um, scholars and not everybody necessarily agrees. So the most common one that we see and that um, kind of fit um, the most with um, the question that we saw originally, that kind of survey question that I showed you, um, treats ideology as unidimensional. And so essentially it's a left-right spectrum. So are you very liberal, um, which tends to be associated with being the left, and are, or are you very conservative, which tends to be associated with the right? Um, and so a left-right spectrum of liberal to conservative, or extremely liberal to extremely conservative. Um, yeah, so the... Um, and so this disagreement 
tends to be structured largely over the, um, the importance of hierarchy, authority, and inequality in society. So typically, the right or conservative spectrum tends to be more supportive of hierarchy, more supportive of authority, and more tolerant of inequality in society, where the left-wing spectrum tends to be more challenging towards both hierarchy and authority, and less tolerant of inequality in society. And so that's kind of the uh, standard version of how we look at ideology. Go into a little bit more detail. So the left or liberal um, tends to have preference for change and rejection of inequality. So it tends to be the, the uh, ideological side that is pushing for change in society. Um, terms often associated are things like progressive, system change, equality, solidarity, protest, opposition, uh, radical, socialism, communism. Not all of these are necessarily fair um, terms. Um, many of them, for example, uh, in, in the US or um, sometimes even in Canada, right? If you want to, if you're a, um, a right wing, um, if you're a conservative, for example, and you want to attack a policy, well, you'll label it as socialist or communist. Um, look how extreme that policy is. It's socialist. This is particularly, it's uh, um, for decades, particularly in the US, this was kind of the kiss of, kiss of death on a policy. If, you, if the idea of it being a socialist policy or would bring the US towards being socialist, if that could stick, then the policy was likely to fail. Um, so some of these are terms that probably liberals would embrace, uh, for example, progressive, equality, solidarity. Um, and then some of them are ones that would probably be labeled by um, opponents. With conservative, um, so you have preference for st uh, stability or tradition, right? So where liberals are more in, um, supportive of change, conservatives tend to similar to the, the definition of conservative itself, want to conserve the existing order. Um, and so because inequality is built into this existing order, they're more accepting of inequality. Um, terms often associated, conservative, system maintenance, order, individualism, capitalism, nationalism, fascism, right? Some of them, um, the right, um, people, members of the right uh, wing would, would probably um, agree with or support. So conservative system maintenance order, individualism would probably be terms uh, that many of them would uh, be fine with. Fascism would be, you know, one of the ones that if similar to how if you could label something as communist that can um, hurt the policy, well, if you can get the label of fascist on a policy, um, that's likely to, um, to hurt that policy. So some of them are ones that more opponents of conservatism will um, try to use its labels. So how does this unidimensional approach uh, fit with the bottom-up uh, process, right? So returning to people are born with different psychological needs. Um, so left-right uh, ideological stances reflect, among other things, the influence of heredity, so kind of what you're born with, um, so kind of the genes you inherit. Childhood tem uh, temperament or personality. So um, ideological stances, we can already see kind of the precursors of, uh, to them in um, childhood personalities. Uh, and both situational and dispositional variability in social, cognitive, and motivational need to reduce uncertainty and threat. So that sounds a little bit complicated. So just kind of remember kind of people's built in need to reduce uncertainty and threat. So like I said before, some people are more tolerant or accepting of uncertainty in their lives, where some people it causes them great deals of anxiety um, and they have a need to try to reduce uncertainty. Um, and so um, particularly, uh, generally speaking, for example, um, conservatives are less tolerant or less accepting on a psychological uh, basis of uncertainty and threat. Right. If they see uncertainty, if they're, they experience any threat, they have a need to need. They have a psychological need to address it. Um, people who tend to um, have more liberal ideology tend to be more accepting of threat um, or uncertainty, or they don't feel quite as much need to 
um, reduce uncertainty and threat. Um, and so these uh, things, so um, the kind of hereditary nature and personality, right, um, brought in with, in particular, the focus on uncertainty and threat or tolerance of uncertainty and threat are some of the kind of psychological um, precursors to ideology. Um, and some studies that have actually looked at ideological basis have found that about 40 to 50 percent of variation in ideology can be explained by uh, genetic differences. So in that nature versus nurture debate, oftentimes when we talk about, about ideology, we talk about kind of socialization, what we learn from our families, from our friends, from our schools, from the media. Um, and, and that's super important, right? But studies have also shown that, you know, a lot of it, uh, the 40 uh, the 50 percent of variation in ideology can actually be explained by things that we're born with and so we have to pay attention to that too when we're dealing with ideology and when we're dealing with people who we don't agree with right some of it is coming from you know what they've learned potentially at home some of it's also just more uh, psychological needs that they're born with so uh, when we're talking about uh these different kinds of psychological needs conservatism is often linked to death anxiety, um, system instability, so anxiety related to system instability, uh, fear of threat and loss, dogmatism, um, so that's um, holding on um, to particular beliefs kind of in, even in the face of kind of contradictory uh, information, so sticking zealously to a particular belief. Uh, intolerance of ambiguity and personal need for order, structure, and closure. Uh, so, Things have to be ordered and structured, um, and personal need for closure, so not uncertainty, right? So once we know something, it's closed, we don't have to investigate more and have new, we don't have to be open to new experiences. So I, again, going along with kind of the conservatives' um, support of tradition. So threat, uncertainty, you can see kind of going through this list of uh, conservative. Uh, the needs that are associated with conservatism. Liberalism is linked more to uh, openness to new experiences, cognitive complexity, and tolerance of uncertainty. Um, and so, so a lot of that, for example, if we're looking at, um, uh, for example, um, for liberalism being um, less open or sorry, less supportive of inequality or more supportive of equality, right? So that makes a lot of sense if you look at openness to new experiences so openness to engage with other people more tolerance of uncertainty right um doesn't or um you know doesn't necessarily have to view others as threatening where um it, it conservatives uh, have kind of the flip side where other groups can be perceived as um posing uncertainty um, there's new experiences, particularly if you live in, you know, your family or your social, immediate social setting, it's quite homogenous, right? Meeting new people always causes uncertainty. It could, could cause fear of kind of the unknown. Um, and also there's just not the necessary need for opening yourself up to the new experience of meeting people who are different than you. So what's, what are the problems with this unidimensional? I mean, these, this unidimensional uh, view is probably the most common one that you're gonna see, but what's the problems with this unidimensional one that have people looking for other possible structures? Um, so first, it's unclear that citizens use the left versus right dimensions to organize their political attitudes. Um, so for example, someone may have one attitude that's consistent with the left and another attitude more consistent with the right. So we talked about ideology it's kind of a, a map where you have many different values that kind of fit together. Um, and so we would say, for example, someone who's conservative would tend to have a lot of values that are associated with conservatism. So they would have kind of a, a coherent um, cognitive map, right, for making decisions. But if um, in the end, you know, on some issues, somebody is conservative, on some issues, somebody is more what we associate as liberal, well, that poses kind of problems to this as being a structuring how people structure their political attitudes. Um, the, uh, so the second one, um, so the second problem is more about how we measure ideology. Um, 
so first the idea is that this left right dimension may not be that useful and second is how do we measure it right does a question about self placement on a left right scale really capture ident uh, ideology um, so or is it just really a proxy for so um, party affiliation right is it that you know that say left is more associated with NDP or liberals and right is more associated with the conservatives. And so if you're asked, where do you place yourself on left, right? You, if you're conservative, you place yourself on the right. If you're liberal, you place yourself on the center left. Eh? And if you're uh, vote NDP, you place yourself on the far left, right? It, it, um, it, it, that it's even simpler in, in the US where you've got the, the two political parties. If you're a Democrat, do you, play, you place yourself on the left. And if you're a um, a Republican, you place yourself on the right. So is it really just tapping into party affiliation? Um, or are people actually understanding what this left-right divide means? So people have also looked then at ideology as multidimensional. Um, and in this case, they've separated as having social and economic dimensions. So rather than just one left-right continuum, there's a continuum for social conservative to social liberal and economic conservative to economic liberal. Um, so there'd be separately, uh, so yeah, ideological beliefs about social issues are separate from ideological beliefs about economic uh, issues. So for example, someone could support higher taxes for the wealthy uh, and social programs uh, for the poor. Uh, so these would be liberal views typically, but oppose uh, same-sex marriage and affirmative action programs, conservative views. So they might have kind of more liberal economic um, views, but more socially conservative views. Uh, and so we typically identify libertarians as, so you've got your just your uh, people who are through and through liberal, you have people who are through and through conservative, but then we also have people who are liberal in one dimension and conservative in the other dimension. So libertarians are those who are socially liberal, but economically conservative. Um, and then we have populists. And so populists we've seen um, discussed a lot more, um, particularly um, in the mid since 2015, 2014 onwards, um, with kind of the rise of Donald Trump. And those uh, are, are often viewed as socially conservative and economically liberal. Uh, and so part of what Donald Trump was able to tap into were people who were more um, socially conservative. So Donald Trump was able to get as the Republican nominee, people who were Republican through and through, or, or sorry, conservative through and through, so economically and socially conservative. But he was also able to tap into a lot of people who were social, economically liberal, so who normally on economic issues uh, vote Democrat, um, but, are also socially conservative. And so many of them, because people often vote economically, many of those populists normally would have voted Democrat. But because Donald Trump was able to play into their social conservatism and make that into kind of the rallying cry, he was able to get many of them to vote Republican. So research uh, by Napier and Jost in uh, 2008 found that poor people are more likely to be drawn to right-wing ideology for social reasons. So, and wealthier people are more likely to be drawn to right-wing ideology for economic reasons. So who selects into these different ideologies, right? So um, uh, poorer people tend, are more likely to come in more on the kind of um, potentially vote, um, a more, a more conservative political party or hold um, conservative views for social reasons. Um, and wealthier people are more likely to be drawn towards right-wing ideology for economic reasons. So to kind of maintain their social position, um, so that makes a lot of sense uh, from the wealthier perspective. Uh, um, and maintaining your social position, if you're already wealthy, then you want to maintain the structures that protect your wealth. So despite what we've shown that, you know, some people tend to hold, you know, liberal views on, in, on either social economic grounds and conservative views on the other, um, there's um, the, major I'm sorry, the majority of people still tend to be um, consistent across both. 
So even though we find that there is a social and economic dimension, there tends to be heavy overlap between them. So um, economic conservatives tend to be social conservatives and economic liberals tend to be social liberals. So most people are consistent on both the economic and social dimensions um, or continuums. But there definitely are some people um, who are not consistent, who will be um, conservative on one and liberal on the other. Another view of multidimensional, so the previous one that we looked at for multidimensional puts ideology as a, an economic and a social continuum. Um, there's also a view of ideology that um, has ideology be composed of continuums on what's called um, social dominant orientation and right-wing authoritarianism. Um, and so ideology is organized along two relatively independent, though often related, so similar to the economic and social one. Um, their SDO and RWA are independent continuums, but they also tend to overlap considerably, considerably between people who uh, support them. Uh, social attitudinal dimensions, which have quite different social attitudinal and motivational basis, right? So um, they tend to overlap greatly in terms of who falls where, but if we want to be understanding where they come from, what are the, cog what are the psychological needs that lead people towards these ideological positions, they're quite different. And so that's where we could see that partially as multidimensional because people get there for different reasons. And so we need to understand both. So what are uh, right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation? Uh, so right-wing authoritarianism um, reflects a view of the world as dangerous and threatening and therefore necessitating a sense of security and social order in society, right? So people who score high in right-wing authoritarianism view the world as a dangerous place, right? And so there's threats around all the different, uh, around the corner. Um, and, and so because there's a view of the world as threatening, right, and there's and, and, and a dangerous place, um, then uh, will tend, people who hold that, those beliefs will um, fairly, I suppose, understandably um, support policies um, that uh, you know, enhance security um, and um, promote social order, right? If you think there's a lot of threat, then you, then you want to feel secure. Uh, and so RWA, right-wing authoritarianism tends to predict social conservatism. Social dominance orientation, on the other hand, is a view of the world as a ruthless competitive jungle in which power struggles are endemic, right? So um, the world is kind of a, a dog-eat-dog -dog world where, um, it, I mean, if you want to get ahead, if you want to succeed, no one else is going to give it to you, right? You've got to go out there and take it for yourself. If you want success, you've got to go and earn success and you've got to go out and um, do whatever it takes to get there. And some people are gonna hold strongly to that view based on their individual psychology. Um, and if you hold that view, um, if you tend to score higher in uh, social dominant orientation, then that tends to predict economic conservatism. So more associated with, say, individualism, support for individualism, support for capitalism, uh, and just letting kind of people um, self-help, right? Let people do uh, what they need to do to get ahead. Um, and because that's the way is, the world is viewed as functioning, right? That's how the world works. Remember, ideology is partially based on a belief of how the world works and from a belief about how the world works and what we want and how we, and, and what we want the world to look like we can then come to, to policies right so both of these right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation um, um, help shape our understanding of how the world works so that side of ideology right um, so although they tend to protect social conservatism and economic conservatism so different um, ideological dimensions, they tend to overlap. 
So you don't have to memorize um, this um, slide here, but I kind of just wanted to put a little bit of it together, showing how our world views. So we have kind of uh, personality, right, kind of at the start, and our environment can influence our worldviews. So do we have a worldview of the world as dangerous or a competitive jungle? So dangerous being kind of your uh, right-wing authoritarianism and uh, a competitive jungle being your social dominance orientation. And so your worldview on this, so whether you score high in SDO or RWA is influenced by two things. First, personality and so psychological needs. Uh, and the other being your experiences in the world. So for example, say you, your early formative years, you're experiencing, uh, you know, a world with a lot of threats, a lot of war, a lot of violence. You grew up in a community with a lot of violence. Then you're more likely to hold the views, worldview that the world is dangerous. Um, and so, uh, life events, so the outside but also internal psychological influence our worldview. Our worldview and our personality, so whether we view the world as dangerous and our personality both influence um, our ideological attitudes. So whether we hold right-wing authoritarian attitudes or not, whether we hold social dominance orientation uh, uh, views or not. And then these ideological attitudes um, influence our, whether we view social threats uh, and whether you know, competition over dominance. So whether we're supposed to be competing with other groups, um, whether we view this these as kind of pervasive or not, and then can lead to, so if you tend towards right-wing authoritarianism and SDO, so you view competition for group dominance and perceived social threats, this will lead towards right-wing politics, nationalism, ethnocentrism, and intolerance and prejudice. So this is kind of just a map of how all these different things come in, but how both kind of outside influences, so the world around us, but also personality do shape these things. So what are the consequences of ideology um, in terms of uh, evaluating? Uh, so the first is in terms of evaluating um, issues. Right, so the most obvious consequence of ideological orientation is its influence on political attitudes and behaviors such as voting. Uh, and so many different studies um, have shown that uh, those who identify as liberal tend to adopt issue positions that are conventionally recognized as left of center, evaluate liberal political figures more favorably, and vote for candidates of the left whereas those who identify as conservatives tend to adopt positions that are right of center, so hold attitudes or opinions that are typically right of center, um, support um, policies that are more conservative or right of center, evaluate conservative political figures more favorably, and vote for candidates on the right. And that makes a lot of sense that political ideology would inf influence political opinions and things like voting. What we also though see is that left-right differences uh, uh, emerge in many other way, uh, areas um, and in areas that are outside of politics. And this makes sense if we think about that ideology comes from underlying needs. So for example, you know, openness to new experiences. Um, and so because ideology uh, and uh, political ideology, a lot of uh, political ideological differences do have a psychological component. It's not surprising then that we'll see ideological differences um, coming about or be seen in other places because these other beliefs, these other non-political beliefs or these other non-political preferences, right, um, have similar psychological underpinnings. So for example, Self-identified liberals were significantly more favorable concerning foreign, foreign films, so that would fit with openness to new experiences, big cities, poetry, tattoos, and foreign travel, whereas conservatives were more fav uh, favorable concerning fraternities and sororities, which tend to be quite traditional uh, and fitting in with um, existing hierarchies, uh, sport utility vehicles, drinking alcohol, and watching television. Um, and so um, we, we see, and 
you know, some of it would be socialization, things that we're going to talk about, some of these differences can be explained, you know, why is it that liberals are more supportive of poetry or tattoos, some of it um, will be, you know, the socialization component, people are socialized to be politically conservative or also socialized into or sorry, political liberal or um, are also socialized into kind of supporting tattoos and poetry. Um, but some of it's going to be coming also from kind of the psychological needs. Like I said, uh, foreign films, if you're open to new experiences, uh, then, you know, a, a foreign film is more attractive than if you're close to new experiences um, or if you don't like uncertainty. Um, travel same is similar thing. There's uncertainty, there's risk in foreign travel, there's an openness to new experiences, there's experiencing new cultures. Um, so if you have a psychological need where you like those things, well, then that makes sense that you'd be supportive of foreign travel uh, and want to travel abroad, where um, if you're not, if you don't have a need for these things, if, or, or even if I'm um, the opposite, if, if you view it as threatening uh, to yourself, um, then you're going to be less supportive. So what are the consequences of ideology? And uh, so kind of building on the last one, consequences of uh, uh, ideology, one of them I want to focus in particular is in terms of intergroup attitudes. Uh, so conservatives and right-wing orientations are generally associated with stereotyping, prejudice, tolerance, and hostility towards a wide variety of outgroups. Um, so outgroups being other groups, especially low status or stigmatized outgroups. So kind of fitting in with the more tolerant of inequality. Uh, or uh, Conservatism is system justifying ideology, right? So it's, it's supportive of, the tr of how the system works right now, of tradition, uh, insofar as it leads even members of disadvantaged group to perpetuate the unequal status quo at the level of both implicit and explicit uh, intergroup attitudes, right? So even um, members of minority groups who hold conservative values tend to also support their continued disadvantaged position. And that's one, some of the more uh, nefarious uh, ways where um, we can see kind of um, structural inequality being built in where it, you know, you can have reference to tradition. This is just the way it's done. This is the way the system works. The system's good. Why will we change it? This leads to uncertainty. This leads to possible threat. Uh, there could be negative consequences. And so we just have to keep going along uh, um, continuing with how things have been in the past. Um, now, and, and I'm going to show um, one clip at, at the end uh, that will further support this. Um, I don't want to make it out that um, conservatives, because we don't want to have, I don't want to necessarily have kind of innate, like conservatives are, are bad and liberals are good, um, particularly because we're coming from also the perspective where um, these are based on psychological needs. And I don't want to say that, you know, someone born with bad genetics or someone um, psychological needs are, some are good psychological needs and some are bad psychological needs. Um, and so I don't want to make it out that to say, conservatives are the only ones who do stereotyping or prejudice. There's plenty of prejudice, there's plenty of stereotypes, there's plenty of intolerance um, on the left as well. Racism isn't just associated with conservatives. Liberals um, have done many, uh, committed many racist acts, support many racist policies, have obstructed um, combating, say, systemic racism, systemic intolerance. Uh, liberals have done so as well. So that's not just a one side is good and one side is bad here. There's plenty of blame to go around. Um, also, intolerance towards outgroups isn't only conservative. Towards low status or stigmatized outgroups does tend to be more associated with conservatives, although not uniquely. But stigmatizing of other groups and prejudice towards other groups um, is something that exists on both sides. In particular, we're seeing, in, and I'm going to show a video at the end, or I'm going to post a link for a video because um, it's about 10 minutes, so I'll let you kind of watch it at your convenience. Um, but a speech that's talking about polarization in politics and how it's ruining politics. And it's a video from the US, but it's very applicable to what we see today. Um, and both groups are very guilty right now of stereotyping members of 
who have other political beliefs. So if someone holds a different ideology to you, then they are bad people. Uh, and we hold a lot of stereotypical views about them and hold, have a lot of intolerance towards them as people and their views um, without an open dialogue. Um, we see a lot of voting, and this can be something that um, in the video um, he talks about, that, um, you know, oftentimes now we're going to say that a, a position advanced by a member of another political party or someone who holds a different ideology is bad, and we're not going to support it, and we won't vote for it, even if um, we actually really would agree with it. Um, we're not going to vote with them because it was them it was their idea. And so we can't support it, even though if we had, you know, gotten into speak first, we might have said pretty much the exact same thing. Um, so there is a lot of, we can't give the other side a victory. It's an us versus them in politics, right? Um, and we, we need to defeat the other. They're the enemy. There's a lot of that type of parlance in politics right now. Um, and to a certain extent, there's always been a divide between ideologies. There's always been competition between political parties um, because of you know different beliefs. Uh, and so some level of competition and some level of debate over these ideas um, is inevitable. Um, but it's we've certainly seen an increase in the last several years of an increasing level of toxicity in politics. Uh, and that's not just conservatives who are to blame there. That, um, I think you could probably chalk up equal levels of blame to all the political parties in Canada, all the political parties in the US or in the UK or France or wherever we have uh, democracies. Um, I think there's a lot of blame to go across all of the different political parties. And so continuing on intergroup attitudes. So, um, so many politicians um, have identified uh, these differences. So kind of the differences that we associate with stereotype, prejudice, and tolerance. Um, and, um, and particularly stigmatizing uh, low status or stigmatized outgroups. And they've kind of used minorities um, to um, advance a crime or welfare message. Uh, and this is something that um, some and many of these have been attacked even by cons uh, conservative, but some um, conservative politicians, some conservative campaigns have certainly used this kind of race card, this race threat, um, this enemy at, at the gates uh, type thing. So we need strong policy because look at this minority group. If we don't have strong crime policies, this minority group will threaten you and will take your money or it'll they'll come and attack you or they'll steal from you. Uh, and so I wanted to show you a f uh, just a few um, uh, ones. That, uh, um, so the uh, Willie Horton one was from the um, uh, 1990, uh, sorry, 1988 presidential campaign, but this is the famous one in political science circles for this. Uh, and these are more recent. This was from a uh, Virginia uh, gubernatorial, so for election for governor in, um, uh, in uh, Virginia uh, fairly recently. Uh, uh, and involving the MS-13 gang. And this was more of a presidential one, so kind of a build the wall type video for how President Trump will um, keep you safe and uh, liberals are complicit in many uh, bad things. So let me just switch over so I can show you uh, these videos. All right, so here's the first one. Um, Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. Right, so it's using a crime issue, right? One of, okay, so my opponent uh, was soft on crime. 
uh, and let people out and that led to crime. But where, where this campaign was, um, or this video was attacked by many, uh, including many conservatives, was that, you know, the, the example of Willie Horton um, was a black man. So it was using a racial minority to play up the crime. Oh, look at all of these violent uh, black individuals that will be let out into our safe white communities if you elect Dukakis. Um, and so it was that imagery as opposed to just playing up, okay, Dukakis um, is bad for crime, but it was also this racial imagery that went of it, of linking minorities. So playing on kind of that fear element of other groups. All right, so here's the... Um, MS-13 appears to be surging again. The dangerous street gang, MS-13, are responsible for the recent murder in Bedford County. And those crimes have been increasing around our region. MS-13 is a menace, yet Ralph Northam voted in favor of sanctuary cities that let dangerous illegal immigrants back on the street, increasing the threat of MS-13. Ralph Northam's policies are dangerous. I'm Ed Gillespie, candidate for governor, and I sponsored this ad for a safer, stronger Virginia. So in that one, again, so if you elect this person, this violent uh, Latino uh, gang is going to come to uh, our Virginia cities uh, and, you know, my opponent support all these policies that are going to help um, them bring crime here. This other group will come into our peaceful place and we're already seeing signs of the, because of his policies, we're already seeing signs of them coming into our peaceful society and bringing um, murder and crime and theft and rape into our communities. And here's That's illegal immigrant Luis Bracamontes, charged with murdering two police officers. It's pure evil. President Trump is right. Build the wall. Stop illegal immigration now. I will break up soon and I will kill more. Democrats who stand in our way will be complicit in every murder committed by illegal immigrants. President Trump will fix our border and keep our families safe. I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message. Right. So those three kind of show how, and it, it fits along with what we've talked about. Um, you could almost see how these videos, which are definitely using kind of the fear of minority groups to link to other issues that are important, but you could see how these are tied in, how these might be effective to people who will hold some of those um, psychological characteristics. Whereas criticized was that it was playing on stereotypes, right? Um, there's not necessarily, um, you know, there's violent members of all racial different groups. But the people who created these campaigns knew that if you used another group, if you used kind of this out group where we're, we're fearful of people we don't know, then it's going to be more effective in getting your crime or your welfare message across. Okay. Now, the last one. So I've got the link here, and you can watch it um, on your own um, if you'd like. So this is the one that was talked about. Um, so this was um, John McCain, or the now late John McCain, a U.S. senator, um, and uh, what I chose um, this video uh, partially because some of the slides and some of the discussion in those last videos were more harsh on conservatives, um, and John McCain himself is a conservative, uh, and here is advancing, I think, a message that's important for everyone to talk about. So when we've been talking about the kind of toxicity in politics and how um, there such, seems to be such a wide gap uh, between ideologies uh, and between the political parties and an unwillingness to work together that we just vilify members of the other group. They're awful people. We can't work with them. We can't be friends with them, right? And John McCain is calling for a return to that, pointing to this polarization, this kind of the extreme divide between the different political parties. And we, we see this, even though this is um, a speech in the US Senate, we see this in Canada too. Um, and so calling for saying, pointing to either this polarization is damaging, 
and calling for return towards civility. And so I think this is a really important message, A, because John McCain was a huge figure um, in terms of working across party lines. Even though he was a Republican, even though he was a conservative, he was willing to work to find common ground with Democrats, with liberals. So that's a good message in and of itself. Um, and, uh, and this message, um, this speech was given shortly before his death, shortly after his diagnosis um, with a brain tumor. Um, so it was when he returned a few days after his diagnosis, um, this speech was uh, given. So um, I think it's a, a nice way kind of to end. And before we start getting into our, um, our debates, to remember that the importance of civility, even if people hold different ideas, we, um, we, um, we get more things done if we work together than if we just hold out for what we would like best, our ideal policy, but we then don't have the strength in numbers, say in legislature or in government to get it passed. We get more done if we work together and if we listen to each other and if we don't treat others as the enemy. Um, and so I think that's a nice message kind of for the ending. So I encourage you to watch the video. All right, so that's the end of the first lecture for today. Um, so I hope you all have a great weekend and uh, talk to you soon.